you're just joining us, please grab food. If you're already with us, please grab seconds. I'm a Jewish mom, so I want to make sure everyone eats and eats and eats some more. While you listen to our two distinguished guests, who are here today at this Berkman Center Luncheon, back to the drawing board, student piracy in Massachusetts, primary and secondary school. We are delighted to have Jesse Rossman and Kate Crawford of the ACLU of Massachusetts here with us today. Um, to tell you all about the wonderful report that the ACLU recently released that takes a broad look at the student privacy policies, or lack thereof, I guess that might be fair to say, in a variety of diverse communities across our state, and really takes a probing look at the question of if students do not shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door, which according to the United States Supreme Court they are not supposed to do, how does that still apply in the digital age, and does it currently in any meaningful way? So both of you are very um, seasoned ACLU veterans at this point. Jesse was previously with the ACLU of Michigan, joined the ACLU of Massachusetts in 2013, and has litigated a broad array of cases, including many on privacy at both the trial and appellate levels. And on a personal note, it's wonderful to be here with Jesse at HLS because we went to school here together longer ago than I'd like to admit. Um, Kay directs the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts and is also an expert on digital surveillance, privacy, and interrelated concerns. So I'm Leah Plunkett and I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center. I'm also a, an associate professor of the University of New Hampshire School of Law. So it's wonderful to see all of you and without further ado to our two distinguished guests. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jesse, and Kate and I are very excited to be here to talk with you guys. Um, if you all have been to some of these luncheons before, you may know we're actually not going to be up here talking for very long. We figured we would jump off the conversation with a bit of an overview, uh, both of our findings, what we had in the report, which Kate is going to touch on in a second. Um, I'm first going to give a very broad overview of the state of student privacy law here in Massachusetts today. For those of you who are experts in this field, uh, it generally goes much more detailed than what I'm going to do with my broad overview, but I figured I would give us some starting points that we could have in our conversation. Kate will then provide some of the building blocks of what we found in our report, and then we really hope the vast majority of uh, the lunch we can spend in an active dialogue with all of you, because the real purpose of us putting out this report was to start the conversation and continue it with folks like yourselves who are interested and interested enough to come out in this gross weather. And as a result, I feel like no one should have to be out in this rain without swag. So we did bring these handy dandy, it's kind of like of a piece of our talk right now. It's these stickers for your web cameras. You can put them on your phones. You can put them on your laptops. They're like color forms. For those of you who liked color forms when you were kids, you can remove them. They're not going to goop up your camera. Um, so please feel free to take some. Take some from your friends. Use them widely. They're super fun. Uh, so you're going to hit that up. Excellent. So we're here today to talk about technology in the classroom in a broad variety of circumstances. Uh, the main areas that we focused on in this report was looking at student information systems, which you sometimes will hear described as SIS. Those are some of the cloud platforms that schools can upload all of the information that they collect about students that maybe used to be kept in a drawer in just a, a written down format, now up, uploaded to, to the cloud. One-to-one -one technology, so devices that schools are giving to students to use both in the classrooms and when they take home, uh, be that a, a laptop or a Kindle or a tablet, something of that nature. Uh, internet usage when you are on school property, uh, excuse me, physical surveillance when you are on school property, so any of those video cameras. So the ACLU's position is you know, kind of laid out here, which Hallie J. Pope, I should just give a shout out, she's a legal fellow that we have at the ACLU of Massachusetts now. She is an HLS grad, and she is a lawyer and legal cartoonist. Uh, and this is part of her work. Actually, one of my proudest moments as a lawyer uh, was that I was cartoonified in the broader version of this. Cade was as well. It was very exciting. My father You'll just found it, it actually, it. and he was like, you're cartoonified. Uh, but so as we sort of lay out in these two panels, 
we agree and believe that technology can be a really powerful tool uh, for education in the classrooms, but we need to make sure that that isn't at the expense of privacy, which is also a really important tool in our classrooms, to make sure that students are learning in an environment where they feel free and safe to express their views, explore different ideas, and really figure out what their identity is. And in a lot of ways, this is their first time participating in something that is a touch point for the government, right? This is the first time that they are participating as citizens and people who will become voting members of this country. And we think it's important to set that stage that people don't begin to get uh, the sense that it's okay for the government to be surveilling you. It's okay for the government uh, to have access to all of your private information. To the contrary, we think this is the perfect place and schools are really important to create an environment where students know that there are limits on what the government can and can't do and that there's a proper way to balance access to technology, creating safety in the schools, and the very important right of privacy in the schools. So there are two different, this is excellent, how do current laws and regulations sort of uh, cover that? There are two main areas that I want to touch on very briefly with you, uh, and that is with respect to data sharing, so with respect to those student information systems that I mentioned, uh, where folks can, where schools, excuse me, can upload information to the cloud, uh, and then searches of electronic devices and the use of the internet on school grounds. And one thing that I think is really important is everything that I'm about to say to you today is the floor of what the rights are. It's not the ceiling. And that's really important because this final map right there, uh, which is really pixelated and has lots of little boundaries, um, that breaks down all of the different towns and municipalities in Massachusetts. And at the end of the day, schools can put into place policies that are even more protective of student privacy rights than what the Constitution provides or what uh, federal and state laws and regulations provide. In a lot of instances, we think that would be in the school's best interest as well as the student's best interest. Uh, and so we think it's always important to emphasize the laws here are just the floor, not the ceiling, and schools can go above and beyond, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that they can do that. Uh, but so very quickly, with respect to data sharing, um, this is a lot of text, uh, which is on our report, which is available. Did we make that available? OK. So it's on our website. Um, but the two main laws that really govern this are FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. That's a federal law, and it's accompanying regulations. And also the Massachusetts Student Privacy Regulations, which for legal wonks out there, is available at 603 CMR 23. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have a fun acronym like FERPA. So FERPA provides on its face that you can't disclose identifiable student information without consent um, of a parent, which on its face sounds like a very broad protection and strong protection for student information, except in the past 10 years, there um, have been changes to the law, both to the law and then also to the accompanying regulations done by the Department of Education that have really carved out some really broad exceptions. And um, they've done that in two ways. First, the law now says that you can disclose this kind of identifiable information um, to someone who is De designated as a school official, that's the official term, and there's a lot of leeway given to schools about who can be defined as a school official. The second loophole that was created by the Department of Education is that uh, schools can designate corporations to be authorized representatives that can partake in certain roles, including information technology in the schools. And these two loopholes, which were explicitly added essentially to create third party access and corporate access to this kind of information, has really meant that at this point in time, FERPA doesn't create a lot of protections uh, from preventing corporate access uh, to this kind of student information without consent. The Massachusetts regulations, however, haven't been changed in the face of sort of this education ed tech boom that we've seen over the past 10 years. Uh, and they explicitly say that you cannot give um, information that is the student identifiable information without consent unless it is to an authorized school personnel. And there are three different categories of individuals who fall into authorized school personnel. I'm actually going to read them explicitly, which I don't generally like to do, but it's a pretty um, nuanced definition that I think would be important to understanding. Uh, so the first set of individuals are those who evaluate students for special education services. The second set of individuals are those who are working directly with students in their administrative or teaching capacity. 
capacity. Those two are pretty clear. The third set of individuals who qualify as an authorized school personnel are administrative office staff and clerical personnel, including operators of data processing equipment or equipment that produces microfilm or microfish. For those of you in the audience, you know how old that's making this sound, uh, who are either employed by the school committee or are employed under a school committee service contract and whose duties require them to have access to records for purposes of processing information for the student record. Um, so as I said, that definition wasn't, at, that was before, the most recent amendments to this law happened in 2006. It has not been weakened in the same way that FERPA has been weakened, and we think still offers strong protection to the data that is processed about students. However, because this is a slightly outdated law and really the most recent amendments happened prior to this ed tech boom, we think it would be uh, in everyone's best interest for the legislature to update it to really clarify what these meanings are in light of all the new actors who now may or may not have access to student information. Um, so those are the sort of set of regulations and laws that are governing data sharing. I should say that between 2014 and 2017, or 15, yeah, you can switch it, 2014 and 2015, 17 states have passed uh, student privacy data acts that offer stronger protections to the data uh, that is being collected about students, and we think it would be appropriate for Massachusetts as a leader in education to join that movement to ensure that we have the strongest protections possible for our students' information. Um, so that second set of information uh, that we were, uh, excuse me, technology that I wanted to talk to you about today was about searches. Uh, Old school searches happened in backpacks, like the one that is so cutely depicted here. Now students have laptops and Kindles um, and tablets that are provided by the schools. Um, what I'm going to talk about, what our, excuse me, our report really focused on was either school provided technology or students who were using the internet at school. We didn't focus on our report on searches of cell phones, personally owned cell phones, or searches of personally owned um, tablets or, or laptops, but we're happy to talk about that if folks want to. So what this is largely governed by, the state of the law is really shifting and hasn't been clarified with respect to what is going to govern electronic searches on school grounds when you're talking about school-owned property that was then given to students to use in their own personal capacity. Often these one-to-one -one technology programs ask students to take it home. There was actually one school we found that allowed parents to create their own accounts on, the, on these tablets. So there's a lot of personal usage that is happening and being encouraged in a lot of instances by these schools. And as you all know, the amount of information, personal information that can be contained in a backpack pales in comparison to the amount of information that can be contained in a laptop uh, or even a phone, which was just recently recognized and continuously recognized both by the US Supreme Court in the Riley case uh, and our state Supreme Court here in Massachusetts, the SJC, has also recognized the very specific um, and detailed amount of information that can be contained in these electronic devices. So in a 1980s case called New Jersey versus TLO, they use the acronym for the, the student's name involved because she was a minor. Um, the Supreme Court addressed New Jersey's argument that students had no Fourth Amendment rights once they entered a school building. Um, and what the Supreme Court said was, no way. That's not the way things work. Students don't leave their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door. You still have a Fourth Amendment right. You still have a reasonable expectation of privacy. What we need to determine is how that is going to be balanced against um, the school's desire to create a safe learning environment. And I think one thing that's really important is that the Supreme Court recognized that the arguments that New Jersey was making essentially was, you don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy as a student, and also having any sorts of rights of privacy on school grounds is entirely incompatible with our need to keep the school grounds safe. And the Supreme Court said explicitly, both of these premises are fundamentally flawed. It's just not right. We understand that you as school teachers need to keep your, your students safe. You can do that while also respecting a student's privacy rights. And I think that's really important in terms of understanding the way that should be applied to electronic devices as well. What the Supreme Court said in TLO eventually was that it wasn't going to place the probable cause requirement, which is the requirement that is generally used for law enforcement when they are going to do searches outside of a school environment. And by the way, 
still needs to be applied if you have a law enforcement official in a school building. But for school administrators, what they need to do is essentially apply a reasonable suspicion standard. So you need to have an articulable basis, an actual basis to say, I have a reasonable suspicion that whatever it is that I'm about to search is going to provide evidence either of a violation of a school regulation or of a law, and that search needs to be limited in scope to what you're actually searching for. And that's really important when you start talking about electronic devices, right? Because you could have a very limited search for, like for example, on a cell phone, just the contacts list that someone has. That wouldn't give you the right to then go through and look at all of their text messages, all of their emails, all of their web searches, et cetera. So this dual understanding of reasonable searches when it talks about schools, both in terms of have to have a reasonable suspicion and need to limit its scope, are things that have consistently been applied to physical searches and we think should continue to be applied because the reasons are even more strong when you start talking about electronic devices. Yeah, so just, uh, you folks are probably familiar with the Worry Riley case in, that came down in the Supreme Court last year which held that, the, that law enforcement is required to get a probable cause warrant to search someone's cell phone incident to arrest. So, um, if it's truly the case, as it is here in Massachusetts and, and in many parts of the country, that students can be subjected to cell phone searches based on something less than even reasonable suspicion, uh, they have fewer rights than people who are actually arrested do, which is pretty remarkable. Which, by the way, the Supreme <laughs> Court like actually said, because this was raised, they talked about the fact that the school had said that prisoners don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, and the Supreme Court in the uh, TLO decision said, um, it almost goes without saying that the prisoner and the school child stand in wholly different circumstances, <laughs> separated by the harsh facts of criminal conviction and incarceration. There so. you go. Okay. So we, we knew very little, frankly, about the landscape of student privacy issues in Massachusetts when we set out to do this report. So because we're the ACLU, we filed a bunch of public records requests with um, school districts throughout the state. As Leah said, diverse districts in all throughout the state, many different sizes in rural communities, suburban communities, urban communities. And we asked, as Jesse said, for information about student information systems, one-to-one uh, -one technologies that we like to call school-controlled technologies. We think it's more accurate. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, physical surveillance at school, as well as the use of Gmail accounts that st sometimes students are required to use, and, and Google Apps for Education, and things like that. So what did we find? Well, pretty much all schools uh, share lots of student information with private companies. Only one school that we surveyed didn't. Um, I believe it was the Mystic Valley Charter School yep. that actually runs its own student information system and sends no student data to outside uh, third party companies. But pretty much all other schools in the state and nationwide do. And there are, there are really only a couple of companies uh, I think something like 50% of the market is controlled by two or three major corporations. So this is, I think you can imagine how um, sensitive this information is and given that the, the records of millions and millions of students are being held by just a handful of companies, I think raises some concerns. Um, we also found generally that uh, school districts that actually wrote their own contracts with corporations instead of simply signing a uh, boilerplate boilerplate contract that the company produced generally offered superior privacy protections. Um, we thought that was a valuable insight um, in part because it raises some concerns about uh, wealthier school districts and poorer school districts and the parity um, in terms of the, the privacy protections that these contracts are providing to their students. You know, schools in communities that have uh, funds to hire, you know, decent legal counsel who can take the time to actually study these issues and spell out a contract that will provide better protection for, say, students in Lexington than maybe um, students in a place like West Springfield would get. So we saw that. Uh, and, and on that note, I've, I've actually been in this room and spoken with somebody who is involved with the Cambridge Public School System who is a part of a project called the Massachusetts Student Privacy Alliance, which is very cool. You should check it out. It's basically an effort to address the problem that I just uh, described, which is to say that it's a place where school systems, administrators, uh, superintendents can share information about best practices um, in terms of the, the uh, details of these contracts. And so school systems who, again, don't have the resources to really dedicate uh, someone's general counsel to looking very closely at these issues can, can basically piggyback off of what other school systems has done, have done, which I think is pretty useful. Um, so the one-to-one -one devices issue, <laughs> Oh boy, we, so this is a great story actually. We, 
Jesse and I were feverishly, it's probably embarrassing to describe how feverishly, getting ready to produce this report the night before we were ready to publish it. Nuanced, and, it was nuanced. <laughs> yeah, it was totally nuanced. It was very late night. And, um, <laughs> and at about 4.30 p.m. that night, I got a phone call at my desk, and the, the thing on my, you know, the caller ID said, Go Guardian. Has anybody ever heard of Go Guardian? So this is a company that manufactures what is basically malware um, that runs on uh, computers and iPads that school systems give out to students. And GoGuardian, up until that moment, had on its website, it was bragging about its anti-theft mechanisms, which included um, key logging. Do you, I, you, you know what key logging is? Logging every single keystroke on a computer. Um, key logging, remote activation of webcams and microphones, location tracking of devices. So this was all prominently displayed on the GoGuardian website. The moment that I received this phone call, I checked, it was still there. Um, and this woman on the other side of the phone told me, we have heard that you are about to through publish a report. Vine. Yeah, through the grapevine, that you are about to publish a report that contains some inaccurate information about our company and the software we, we provide. And I said, wow, that's fascinating. What's inaccurate about it? And by, by the way, this was a marketing person. This was not a lawyer on the phone with me. And she said, well, the inaccurate information is that we no longer do key logging or remote webcam activation. And I said, that's great. When did you stop doing it? And she was like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Anyway, long story short, they claim now that they have turned off those features, which I think was probably the first victory that we had from this report. So anyway, but uh, there are a lot of other programs very much like this that essentially um, install like back doors in, in these computers, making them very insecure, by the way, to hackers and, and anybody who potentially wants to get inside a student's computer, um, enabling administrators at the school to see everything that's happening on the computer, sometimes even change content on the computer, um, remotely uh, install applications and software, uh, remotely update software and things like that. So you know, some of those things are reasonable. Obviously, we, we would prefer that school systems maintain these computers and run the latest software so that students aren't you know, exposed to uh, software exploits and hacks and things like that. But there are clearly concerns um, when the, the IT guy who's like nobody even knows his name, who maybe works in a broom closet somewhere, um, has access to the sensitive information of hundreds of students that are using these computers, as Jesse said, not just for schoolwork at school, but at home. Um, often, you know, their parents sometimes are even encouraged to use them. Um, we all know what kinds of sensitive information we uh, put onto our computers. So another thing that we discovered is um, that's almost ubiquitous that schools have surveillance cameras today. Um, not necessarily in private areas like bathrooms or locker rooms, obviously, but in hallways, um, in auditoriums and cafeterias. And unfortunately, most schools, frankly, did not have policies to govern um, you know, what happens to this information, who has access to it under what kinds of circumstances. So that was pretty alarming. There was another victory with this um, report thus far, that there was one of the school districts, Holyoke, that didn't have a written school policy, that following our public records request, they ended up instituting one. And I think that, plus the Go Guardian story, like both are really great indications. When people say that parents and students don't care about privacy, I just think that's a lie. I think what it means is that they may not be aware of the different potential invasions of privacy that are, is occurring in the school system, because as we've seen time and time again, once they become aware of some of these technologies and practices, or lack thereof, in place, people are deeply concerned. Right. So um, probably the most disturbing thing that, in my view, that we found across the board at schools in Massachusetts is that schools maintain policies that say students have no expectation of privacy on school networks, on school devices, and even using email accounts that students are required to use um, as a part of their academic life on, on campus. This is extremely disturbing to me because, as Jesse said, you know, school is where we teach young people what to expect from the world, right? Um, school is where young people learn the norms of their society, you know, what's, what are their rights and responsibilities. And if we are raising up a whole series of generations of young people who have never been told that they are to expect any sort of privacy in their digital information, 
that's going to be a real problem when those people become adults. Um, they may well believe, well, what do I have to hide? I've never had any right to privacy. Ever since I you know, went to school in, in kindergarten, I've been told, well, uh, nothing you do online, your email is never private. So we've been talking you know, with superintendents, with school officials about these issues. And to be fair to superintendents, they don't set school policy. In Massachusetts, school policy is set by school committees. Um, but the things that superintendents have told me effectively across the board whenever I've had these conversations with school officials, it goes like this. Well, we have to keep students safe. And then I say, well, actually, this is not about keeping students safe. You have filtering mechanisms, which are different from you know, reserving the right to monitor everyone's email or look at every website they're visiting. Filtering is one thing. You have to do it to receive federal grants. We understand um, mon you know, reserving the right to monitor anything at any time for no reason is something totally different. They say, OK. And then they say, well, look, we don't even have the staff to do this, right? Like, we don't have enough. We, we, we can barely pay people to, to run a music class. We don't have staffing to have folks actually looking at what students are doing online or reading their email unless we have some sort of reason to believe that they're up to no good. Aha! So make that your policy. That's all we're saying. That's what we want the policy to be, is what schools are effectively already doing, which is saying students do have a right to privacy on their internet use at school. Um, in their emails at school, and on the devices that schools give them to take home and use as if they're their own. The only time that that right to privacy would um, <clears throat> be you know, penetrated, I guess, is if the school has some sort of reason to believe a student is using the internet to violate a school policy or to break the law, which is, again, what they say they're already doing. So, so we very strongly believe that these policies should be changed and that, they should, um, that schools should educate children about their digital rights and responsibilities. You know, the internet is a powerful place. It can be, sometimes be a dangerous place. That doesn't mean, however, that uh, adults should be telling children, you have no rights. Um, we find that to be a very dangerous proposition. So the last thing that we looked at was um, the use, very widespread again, of uh, corporate apps for education. So Google is, um, I don't know how many of you are, are aware of this trend, but Google is fast taking over state and local governments. Um, Google, <laughs> no, it's really true. I mean, Google maintains the email systems and um, database systems often for many, many, many city and state governments across the country. Um, the Boston Police Department last year uh, started using Gmail servers to run its email. Um, you know, you can decide for yourself whether or not you think that's a good idea. Um, but also school systems increasingly are using Gmail accounts and what this whole suite of uh, programs that falls under the rubric of something called Google Apps for Education. Um, students are not, these are not optional accounts. You know, students are required to use a Gmail account in many of these schools if they want to uh, go to school to, to get you know, grades for full, full participation. And you know, we don't have time here, I don't think, to get into the reasons for why that may be problematic. But I'm sure you can imagine that um, it wasn't always the case that in order for young people to participate fully in a public school environment where, again, they're required to go or their parents will go to jail, quite literally, um, <laughs> that they would be forced to use a, a very invasive product produced by a you know, gargantuan uh, multinational corporation that has more information about all of us than God. So um, now that's starting at a very young age. And, and there have been some lawsuits. Google, years ago, uh, was found to have been using information it was uh, collecting about children in schools to create dossiers, to market to them. Um, there was a lawsuit to stop that practice. Uh, Google has. <laughs> in recent years, been accused of continuing the practice, um, even after it said it would stop. So you know, it's up to you, I guess, to decide whether or not you think Google should be in schools. We think that there are a whole host of issues that this kind of uh, you know, corporate invasion of, of public school systems raises for, for children, really. So what do we think should be done? Well, I don't know if you can read this, sorry. Um, for students, we basically want students to, to know what's going on for them, right? And to have to be armed, especially high school students, you know, kids who are a little bit older, to be armed with the kind of information they need to figure out what's going on in their school system. Um, and so here, this is just taken from the um, executive summary recommendations from our report. We also want students to know that 
they shouldn't use school communications for certain kinds of things, right? I mean, if it's true that they're being monitored at school or that the school reserves the right to monitor them, then they should take appropriate um, you know, measures to ensure that their information is not going to be exploited or that they won't get in trouble for, frankly, something that, you know, they, that they're doing that isn't necessarily malicious but could be read as such. So, the, you know, this, this section sort of dovetails with um, a Department of Justice Obama administration program called Countering Violent Extremism. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but it's a concern, it's a real concern for the ACLU that uh, this is a program that is kind of built off of, or based off of uh, the UK program called Prevent, which has generated a lot of controversy across the pond, in part because it has whipped up so much fear and hostility against Muslims or um, ridden this wave of Islamophobia, really, and is um, encouraging you know, public health providers, teachers, to basically uh, racially profile students and view Muslim students or Arab students as inherently suspect and maybe report those students for behaviors that are totally benign. So one example of this is just last week, uh, a woman in the BBC, or rather a woman in the UK, gave an inter interview to the BBC talking about how her four-year-old son, um, his pre-K teachers, his nursery school teachers, wanted to report him to the anti-terrorism police in the UK through this PREVENT program because he drew a picture of his father cutting a cucumber. Um, and there was a knife involved, and the teachers became very concerned that this kid was a terrorist or something, or that his father was a terrorist. So this is the kind of thing that um, you know, is starting to seep over into the United States through CVE. You know, they're encouraging the FBI, in fact, just last week or two weeks ago, put out uh, some guidelines that it's, it's encouraging teachers to use in public school settings about looking out for signs of you know, anti-American hostility and things like this. Um, you know, that would have been me as a teenager, frankly. I railed against you know, US uh, foreign wars. I was like always talking about slavery and the American genocide and how the US is built on lies and all. You know. So I'm clearly not a terrorist. Um, people in the United States have the right to dissent. We have the right to, frankly, believe that our government sucks. Uh, and we think it's troubling that the government is encouraging um, school teachers to view those students as potential terrorists. And, and we think that you know, students should know that this kind of stuff is happening and be aware in terms of you know, the way that they are using devices that the school is saying can be monitored for, for no reason at all. I can add as well, so as Kate has just pointed out, there is an overlay here um, with respect to some of the racial justice work that we do, as well as sort of freedom of speech work that the ACLU does. I think another layer uh, that we saw time and again, which comes up with technology, um, is there's an equity piece as well, because for many students, particularly in some of the rural districts that we were looking at, although not exclusively, the laptop, for example, that's being provided may be the only computer that is being used in that household. Um, or the internet access that's being provided at school may be the only internet access that that student has. And what you start to see is an instance where you can buy privacy if you have access to buy your own computer, but if what we are telling students is the only thing until these policies are changed is that you just shouldn't use your school-owned device for personal business or to send personal messages, and that's the only access that they have, it creates a real issue um, of socioeconomic equity that comes up time and again in these issues as well. Yeah, definitely. So for parents, um, um, we're, we're basically recommending similar things. You know, ask, we, we essentially want to arm parents with the information that they need to ask the right questions of administrators. Um, so there's, there's a lot more uh, detail about this in the report. Um, for administrators, we're, you know, offering some advice essentially about, you know, community transparency, having a public conversation about these issues with parents and students so that none of this stuff comes as a surprise, basically. Um, again, respecting pol uh, privacy with search policies, and then you know being smart when people when administrators are choosing technologies. Like we've, I've I've had conversations with teachers um, who say that they use this thing called Class Dojo, which is like a um, basically a, a student management system for teachers on a much more localized level in the classroom. And those teachers have never read the privacy policy. I mean, they have no idea what's going on with, with the information that they're sending to this company. Um, and oftentimes, administrators, in their uh, desire, their eagerness to adopt technologies in the classroom, are not really doing the appropriate level of homework that they should be doing um, to ensure that these companies are legit, that the privacy policies are um, appropriate, that student information is not going to be 
um, you know, sent to some database like Vtex, which is going to get hacked by China or whatever, um, or frankly just abused by corporations that want to sell that information for, uh, for, for money, for financial reasons. So finally, um, we really think that the, the law needs to be changed here in Massachusetts. Again, you know, dozens of states throughout the country have passed uh, 21st century student privacy law. Massachusetts lags behind, unfortunately. Um, and just very quickly, I'll go over. We um, put out some model legislation, model state legislation with this report. Essentially, it just sets uh, statewide standards, which would address the issue that Jesse talked about related to you know, disparities between wealthy communities and poorer communities. Um, basically, it would say like you can't sell student data. You can't compile profiles of students. Um, you can't advertise to students based off of information that you've collected about them through student information systems or something like ClassDojo. That there would have to be, um, you know, pretty rigid security requirements for the data, as well as data breach notifications. Um, any any uh, requirements rather. Um, it also provides students with privacy protections on school networks and one-to-one -one devices, and basically follows the framework that Jesse described. So. Uh, it would be a reasonable suspicion standard for school policy violations and a probable cause standard for illegal conduct. Um, and then the same standards would apply to student-owned devices under this law. Finally, the law provides for civil damages. So if you're interested in this, you know, come talk to us afterward. We're, we're ho hoping that uh, we'll be able to get somebody in Massachusetts to introduce this in the next legislative session starting in 2017. Um, so that's pretty much it. Cartoon uh, yeah, here's the cartoon. <laughs> and you can see the whole cartoon if you go to this, uh, this link and, and read the executive summary and the whole report. So we're happy to take questions. Sure. I think there's a mic. Should we, cause, only because it's being recorded, so. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, so on the topic, on the topic of uh, encouraging or forcing students to use these laptops that they don't own, mm -hmm. um, generally it's hard to, like if someone gives you a computer and you don't know anything about it other than you're required to use it, using it safely can be really challenging. Like you can try to cover up the webcam and, I don't know, not type in passwords and things, but it gets really hard to anticipate every possible way that the computer could be hijacked. And also, um, yeah, I forget my other thing. Um, anyway, so I was wondering, yeah, what were your thoughts on how you could manage those kind of issues if a student is going to be forced to use it, especially if they don't have an option of buying their own? I mean, I think that that's why we have to change the law, really. You know, that this, this issue should not be individually, you know, it shouldn't be up to individual students or individual families or even individual school systems to implement, you know, software that's secure, or uh, policies that um, ensure that the student's information isn't going to be abused by either the corporation that is running the malware <laughs> or you know, the administrators at the school who have access to the back end of those computer systems. We just need, we need a better law, frankly. And I think in the meantime, some of the things that students can be doing is sort of, as you already mentioned, covering webcams, not using sort of Gmail or any personal email. And I think the other thing that we have seen is when students speak out within their own school systems, that can push um, the school committee and, t and teachers and administrators to actually change the law at the local level until we get something at the statewide level. I think in a lot of instances, as Kate had mentioned, administrators aren't doing this because they don't care about student privacy. They just haven't actually taken the time to think that through. And when there is an incentive to do so because of pressure within the school system, you can actually have some of this change at the local level. Um, thanks. Um, I don't want you to think I'm taking this side, but building on that last question, because I agree with much of your analysis, if not all of it, and recommendations, but if we're talking about students understanding the world we live in and preparing, um, whether we're employed by a private or public sector organization, not-for-profit, or a student at Harvard, our expectations are, of privacy are limited. You know, that's how a couple of years ago we tracked down the IP address of someone who did a bomb scare, I believe. I don't know the details here at Harvard. Um, so, it's you know, actually how, funnier than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we could get into it, but there are many, many examples. And yeah. most of us um, come to learn that whether we're at a university or employed by government or the private sector, we shouldn't have too many expectations. Now, I know we could get into the weeds about specific things, but I just wonder, and I totally agree with the equity issue where some students can afford to have their own devices, others can't. That's also true of working class people. They may have the only computer in their home is from their employer. 
They work for Verizon or the mm -hmm. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I just wonder, you know, given that context, what are your thoughts and expectations? Yeah, I mean, in my view, we shouldn't, um, the lowest common denominator should not carry the day, right? And, and so that's one issue. And the other is that, again, unlike, you know, having a job at Verizon or, uh, you know, choosing to work for a corporation that monitors your email, students don't have a choice. They have to go to public school. Um, so there's no option for them. There's no other option. They can't just get another job that doesn't, you know, at a, at a company that doesn't monitor their email. Um, they have to go to school. And so in my view, it's not, they're not really comparable in, in that sense. Um, and additionally, I would say that, you know, I don't necessarily think it's appropriate for employers to be monitoring their employees either. So, you know, I wouldn't, you know, we're, we don't, our boss doesn't yeah. read our email. <laughs> like we, um, we, you know, at the ACLU, we have, uh, I'm sure that in the, in the contract, it says that they could, right? Well, um, but in but practice, think, that's not. I think the, the, uh, the policy is more important than the practice. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, yeah. So, I mean, it's great to think I work for this nice company and they don't do it, but the bottom line is, yeah, you're right. I should actually tell my boss that we should change that policy, if it exists. <laughs> I mean, I think there's also, first of all, the only way that those policies sort of, I agree with Kay that I don't think that necessarily that should be what our expectation is uh, once we get into the working environment. I think the only way that that changes, it's certainly not going to change, I guess I would say, if we are starting with the premise in school that that is the case. So any sort of drive for a policy change would need to start in the school systems. And I think something that Kate had mentioned earlier, the idea that schools are also environments for for intellectual development and the, and the idea of the free speech sort of implications of that and the, I mean, students experiment a ton in high school in terms of trying on different views to see if that's what they are going to end up believing or not. And I think that extra layer of intellectual development, students are really going to be stunted in terms of the education that we're saying that we're going to provide them in schools if they don't have the freedom to explore. Hi, um, I have two questions not particularly related. One is, I just want a clarification. Does your study also go into, my, go into um, school required software but not necessarily a school provided um, computer? For example, Newton, of course, expects, every, of course, everybody in Newton has their own computer. So my grandchildren, for example, are, still are expected to use not only Google Apps, but there's some other kind of courseware that, mm -hmm. um, they're using. Does does your report uh, deal with no, that? No, we didn't go into that. Okay. Although I imagine the issues are very much the same. The oh, second, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. And the second one is, is, is about the Google Apps. I, you mentioned that, you know, they were caught using student student data. That's the second time they've been caught using student data. So I'm just wondering what relief there is under the law to uh, A, force them to wipe out what they've got, and B, to keep them from doing it again. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll answer that as a non-attorney. That's part of the reason we want a stronger law in Massachusetts, so that we know that there are civil damages guaranteed in cases like that. You know, I'm, I'm not clear on, on whether or not there could be a successful lawsuit against Google hasn't today been thus far. in Massachusetts. <laughs> I mean, they yeah. settled it. But. Yeah, I mean, so the lawsuit in California was settled, and as you've said, they were then later found to have been continually violating student privacy after they settled this lawsuit. So... You know, I'm not sure about the prospects for a, a successful suit in Massachusetts, but certainly if the model legislation that we have drafted is enacted, something like that in Massachusetts, there like, likely very, would be a very strong cause for civic action. I'm wondering if you've um, gotten into the issue at all of who owns what data. And specifically, um, if it's a student, does the student own the data? Does the parent own the data? Does the school own the data? Does Google own the data? Or does a third-party app own the data? And um, are those issues being thought of right now? Yeah, so at least with respect to data collection, um, a student, both a student and a parent always has the right to access their own information that's in a data system. Um, but the school, for a long time, even prior to the time that we were talking about stuff being uploaded into the cloud, had the right to collect that information. Um, and some of the questions that you're getting at right now actually really touch on how are we defining some of those terms I talked about earlier about is it a school administrator, is it someone who has been designated, um, and those are things that are still being worked out right now, unfortunately, um, in 
the courts and also in legislatures. I think something that that becomes really pertinent in is when you talk about third parties, um, it's a little bit confusing because it's really like the second third party that we're talking about with a lot of these student information systems because you have the first layer which is, okay, the school decides to use a platform, let's say Aspen, it's one of the companies that has a student information system. So they upload it. That's like the first band of a third party who has access to that information. In lots of instances, they say that the school still owns that information but that they, um, or they could could at least, but they are simply providing sort of the platform to allow that information to exist. The problem is whether or not the contracts then limit the ability of that third party platform to share with additional third parties. Um, the sharing between a school and a platform, I think for a lot of privacy reasons, insofar as as long as they have sufficient um, security is in place so it's not going to be hacked. It may actually protect the information better than it would have been if it was just in, you know, I'm from Needham, Needham's random like student information systems within that own school system. But once that information, if it's not limited, can be shared to additional third parties, who owns that information becomes really complicated. Some of the contracts, Cade mentioned there was two school districts. Um, it was Worcester and Brockton, I think, who had yeah. written their own contracts. And that had really specific language that said that anytime you shared information, the information, it had to specifically lay out what the information was being shared for, and it couldn't be further used for any other purpose. That kind of limitation, when a school actually has the ability to write the own contract, is a really important way to share the ownership of that information, but it's not happening across the board right now. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with your position with regard to the third party data on the one to on the expectation of privacy in the one to one situation um, I'm curious about how your uh, proposed regulations or laws would or policies would play out in say a situation where the device that's been provided is has been found to be used for a bad thing like mm -hmm. harassing or sexting or whatever and the school officials fear that it's endemic um, let's say they have found it on like 10 out of 30 or something in a classroom or, or in one full classroom my question is does this reasonable suspicion standard mean that they have to have a reasonable reasonable suspicion of every individual student before they can look at their yes, yes. their device so they couldn't so if they found hazing on a football team they and they found and they feared that this was widespread they couldn't look at the devices of every member of the football team that's correct correct unless they had Individual articulable reasons. No, part of that articulable. And, and 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 the fact of a very large number. You know, and a fear that this is become you know spread like wildfire. Well, I mean, is not yeah. Okay, I'm so, just yeah. The case that you've given, I think, is an interesting one because, you know, I'm not a school administrator, but I'm a human being and I have some emotional intelligence, and it seems to me that. Maybe instead of if you really believe that there's a serious hazing problem on the football team, that the approach maybe shouldn't be a punitive one that you search everyone's phones to come up with the you know concrete evidence so that you can expel everybody, but you you know sit the football team down for a conversation about what the hell is going on on the football team, right? Like you guys clearly have a problem with hazing. We need to we need to address it, and maybe you know the team's not going to practice today because you guys have some real social problems. <laughs> I guess I guess I find. I would think that the administrators wouldn't think of looking on other people's, on all the kids' devices in a particular group as uh, punitive as fact-finding. In other words, they need to find out what the problem, you know, you've, you know you've got a problem, you need to scope the problem, right. and you need to do it fast. Well, let's so, just think about the um, analog. I just, it, I'm just, it seems like you may be tying the hands of administrators in serious situations. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think that what you're talking about, I don't know what the tipping point would be, certainly a factor in determining reasonable suspicion that an individual member of, this, of the team may have participated in whatever behavior you're talking about could be that they're a member of the team. I mean, I think if you have a larger number, that probably would be involved in the balancing test of whether or not reasonable suspicion had been met. I think an important component, though, it, the punitive issue that I think Cade may be alluding to here is that it's already, it is an invasion of privacy, regardless of whether or not there is punishment in it, the actual search is a punishment per se, it is a con like a constitutionally recognized right to privacy that will be invaded. Um, but I think a key part, that second part of the reasonable suspicion test, so you need to have something that is an articulable reasonable suspicion and the scope of the search needs to be limited. So perhaps in the situation that you're talking about, let's say they had reasonable suspicion to search for sexting um, for the members of the football team. That wouldn't then allow them to go into the cell phones and search all of their emails, for example, or all of their photographs, unless there was also reason to suspect that. And I think a critical piece also of the legislation, the model legislation that we have, is that the reasons supporting a search need to be documented, and the scope of the search needs to be documented and it needs to be made available to both the students and the parents so that they're aware of what has happened and if it comes to you know, any kind of, uh, either within the school system or in the criminal justice system, some type of punishment that they have the material available to contest it. Yeah, and I just want to be clear about the reasonable suspicion standard too. It is very low. I mean, that is a low standard. Like, It's lower than probable cause. Yeah, I mean, so. probable cause is a standard that we frankly would prefer um, across the board for all types of searches. But, you know, courts have held that there are some circumstances under which government officials can search people, like, for example, on the street for Terry stops. Um, law enforcement does not have to have probable cause that they'll find uh, evidence of a crime to stop someone on the street. They simply have to have, you know, some reason, basically, uh, to, to stop someone. And that's, that's, that's the same standard. So, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not a high bar, we don't think. You know, the, the, the main purpose of a reasonable suspicion standard is to eliminate suspicionless monitoring, which is to say you have to have a reason. It's not, you know, it's not such a high bar. Have you or others at the ACLU given any thought to trying to write some sort of handbook for students on how to disable features of software on these devices that might be invasive of their privacy? So interesting question. That, I mean, no, we have not done that, and we won't do that. But um, I mean, I've certainly thought about what options are available for students who are dealing with these kinds of technological problems. Unfortunately, students in other parts of the country who have tried, you know, hacking around firewalls or uh, getting rid of, um, you know, invasive monitoring software on their computers have gotten disciplined. Um, you know, they're not supposed to mess with that stuff. Hi, I'm Matt. Uh, thanks so much for this awesome presentation. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, I think it's been on a lot of people's minds, has been the uh, DOJ versus Apple issue. And so in relation to this, it sort of makes me wonder why um, a government would be a better fiduciary for the data than, say, Google. I'm not sure how the relationship works in so far as getting to do the peaking. But uh, if you have, if the government owns the data, I feel like they're likely to be able to like, peak on a reasonable suspicion, whereas Google could maybe require a court order and maybe they'll have lawyers that like want to quash a subpoena or something like that. Whereas if you have the data on site at the school, government can just start peeking at stuff and doing things. So I'm kind of wondering how you think about and balance that tension. So I mean, on with respect to what schools can do in owning the data, there are constitutional limits, which at least as it is structured right now, constitutional limits aren't being applied to private corporations. There are other legal limits that are, but not the Constitution. Um, and there, at least to some degree, school officials and government officials are responsive to an electorate in a way that a corporation may or may not be. Now, we have seen in terms of the way that Apple has reacted, for example, to the All Writs Act cases that there ultimately ended up being a commercial reason why Apple Apple chose to encrypt its information, uh, and I think that did largely speak to the fact that they saw that their customers valued this good. Um, but to this point in schools with respect to the constitutional protections that are available, that would only apply to schools. And I think it also 
is governed by the lens for the ACLU, which because we sort of, our mandate is structured around the Bill of Rights and constitutional rights and civil rights um, legislation in both the states and the federal government, that tends to push us towards what are the regulations and things that we can put in place to ensure that the government is respecting all of those rights. Also, just to be clear, as a technical matter, Google might store the data, but the administrator still can access it. So instead of just the administrators having access, it means Google also has access. So it's simply making the problem worse, in our view. Okay, so would it be better if um, Google held it but didn't give the administrators access? No, I mean, that's untenable. Yeah. You know, the administration needs access to student information to give people their transcripts to, you know. I mean, they need to report to their federal government requirements yeah. with respect to what school, local schools need to collect I mean, to them they provide need to, run to the schools, DOE. You know, we're not saying that administrators should never be able to look at student records. That's absurd, you know. The, the issue that, that we have is simply that, you know, there are certain kinds of information that administrators need to use in the course of business, and teachers do. And then there's other kinds of information, like what websites students are reading and what they're saying in their emails to their friends, which are not school matters, right? And those should be distinct. Um, and there should be separate rules applied to, you know, administrator access to, to, the, to those kinds of information. On the law enforcement question, though, um, it doesn't matter if Google stores the information or if the local school stores it. You know, if this bill that we are proposing were to pass into, mm -hmm. into law in Massachusetts, law enforcement would be required to get a warrant to access it from either the school or Google if they wanted to use that information in some sort of criminal prosecution against someone. I mean, I would say just even now, based on, we would like things to be more clearly articulated in that way, but the government possession of information is not come one, come all. Just because one government access has information does not necessarily mean that any other governmental actor would be able to access it. That's particularly true when it comes to information that school administrators has, either via a search, which is under a lower basis of suspicion than what a law enforcement agent would have, or under the SIS, just because, and there are, there have been cases that talk about this, that the difference between what a school administrator can get and then what it can hand over to the police officers are two very different standards. Saul, you got a question? Yes. Um, a basic question out of ignorance. Is there any difference between public schools and charter schools in this context, um, or do the same um, laws and regulations apply regardless of how the school is organized? To my knowledge, it is the same, but I have much less expertise in charter schools thus far, but to my knowledge, it is the same. I think this person had a question too, yeah. Thank you, this is really helpful, and I'm on the Cambridge School Committee, so this oh, is very cool. timely, um, if anybody's interested in Cambridge in particular. Um, I'm interested in, in drift onto social media, so uh, the chorus, uh, the official chorus that sets up a Facebook page, or the chess club, or we have a, a city youth council here that set up their own Facebook page for students to post anecdotes about their experiences around race at the high school. What about these Facebook type of un, much less regulated things that are not official educational applications? That's a really good question, and unfortunately, it's something that I haven't given a significant amount of thought to. Um, but just off the cuff, you know, I would say that certainly this should be opt-in, right? Like, if the chorus has a Facebook page, students should not be required to, you know, feature in photographs that are going to be posted on Facebook if they don't want to be. Um, you know, nothing like that should ever be a requirement for participation in any sort of school activities. Um, you know, beyond that, I don't have any really deep thoughts about it at the moment. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would add on to that is I, I'm glad you said that, Kate, about opt-in. We think about, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, the number of forms that either I had to sign or my mom needed to sign or my dad needed to sign in terms of whether or not we agree to let my photograph be used, whether or not, like, all sorts of permissions that were given for much sort of more discreet actions and the type of information that now is often being given without any sort of notice, let alone consent. So what we're really asking for here is the same degree of protections that schools provided in the analog world to also be applied to the digital context, which, if anything, requires even more supervision of privacy protections. That's a great question, though. And maybe one more question? Uh, hello, it's Michel Riemann from University of, University of Geneva. Uh, I just have a, maybe a more technical question. Uh, how do we uh, guarantee that uh, the, the law reform you're advocating for uh, has teeth in the enforcement sense? Who gets to decide if there's a privacy breach? if there is reasonable suspicion in any given case. And given the fact that there are many different actors, both states and private actors, how do we make one system to make sure they all respect the rules? Mm -hmm. 
Well, so that's why the law um, specifically provides, or the bill as we've drafted it, provides that you know it, it follows the fruit of the poisonous tree uh, model for you know prosecutions, which is to say, if the school violates the law um, or law enforcement gains access, in other words, to student information without a warrant and tries to use that in a criminal prosecution, that it would be inadmissible. Um, and then on the on the civil side, there's there's a um, there's a provision that would enable people to sue for large sums of money, basically. <laughs> and that civil component, the civil damages part is key, right? Because what we see time and again in terms of technology is often you never end up even knowing that your rights have been violated unless there is a criminal prosecution. And we don't want to set up a situation where individuals who potentially, like they weren't even ever charged, don't have a sort of mechanism to redeem the rights that were violated. So that's a critical component to make sure that the enforcement happens across the board. Thank you both so much. Thanks for having us. Interesting, inspiring.